This isn't just a win for James Courtney. This is a win for V8 Supercars. That's an awesome day of racing. Well, James, every year when the Australian Grand Prix rolls around, it's a timely reminder of the connection between Formula One and supercars, and you've probably got the biggest connection of any of us. Uh, just talk to us about, I guess, what goes through your mind every year when you get to connect with those people that were part of your very early racing career. And do you ever wonder what might have been for you? It's, um, it is a tough time. It's not tough, nothing's really that hard, but it's, it's weird because you sort of, yeah, you were that, I was that close and sort of there and living the world and how it was. And yeah, you know, odd life, I said, I didn't want, I, would, I don't ever wonder what could have happened. Um, but I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, um, it is an unusual feeling. It's, it's, um, it's probably a weekend when I want to step up and have a, a good solid weekend. Um, just I, like, they're never watching, like they don't care what we're doing, but I don't know for my own um, self, I just want to have a good weekend when, when it's all on. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been a long time now since then. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's great to, there's a lot of people that I still um, see and, and worked with that are still in, in the pit lane. So it's nice to see those guys. Take us back to the very beginning of your journey. Do you remember that moment or thought that sparked, I want to be a Formula One driver? What was that? Yeah, I, I know it. I was. Uh, I remember I was on the lounge watching the Formula One race, or my dad used to tape them, so I was watching it the next day. And it was the start of the the race, and they're all on the grid. And there was like hot chicks kicking about, and guys were smiling, fast cars. And at that moment, my dad, I was after school. My dad was coming home from work. He didn't look like he was having a good time, and I, I was like, I'd rather earn money doing that than that. So uh, I'll, I want to do that. So it's um, it was pretty early on. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I just, that was it. My sole focus was to be a, a racing driver and thankfully it's uh, touch wood, it's been 43 years of, or not 43 years of racing, but I've never had to have a real job. <laughs> so how does that thought, I want to do that, translate then into actually doing it? Um, I suppose I was just so, I was ADHD, so hyper focus on it. Um, so my whole life was just about that. I remember at school, um, I'd barely do enough just to pass, just to keep mum and dad happy enough. But my, all my school books were full of, full of helmet designs, you know, drawing tracks, all this sort of stuff. I was just mad for racing. And that was the only focus I had. And thankfully, my dad enjoyed, um, you know, the karting side of things. And he's, he was a little bit mechanical. So we sort of did that whole process together. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I suppose it's, um, I don't know, it's just, yeah, blind, just the love of the, the passion of racing. And the first time when I actually drove a go-kart, um, I was just hooked from that moment. What was it about? It's definitely the speed, like, and the challenge of, it sounds stupid, but taming something that, that's so, a go-kart is not that powerful, but when you're eight years old, you're like, wow, this is so crazy. But to tame and know that you've got control of something that's, um, that's so powerful, and I suppose it, it as well is um, it's quite aspirational. So it's, it's something that not many people get to do. Um, so it's sort of, it's that mystique and mystery, mystery of it all. Um, so I suppose that's a little bit of it as well. When did you know you were good at it? Did, did the penny ever drop? I still don't you... know. Um, <laughs> really? No, After all a... these years? I mean, when did you know, I am actually pretty good at this and I, I have an intuition and a feel for it. It was probably pretty early on in karting. I, I got, I had quite a good success straight up, like quite early on. Um, so I realized that I was going pretty good. And I remember my dad um, sort of, we were driving home and someone, he was talking to someone on the phone or something. And I remember him saying something about, you know, he's actually, he's, he's doing really well and everything. So he sort of chest puffs up and, but ultimately it'd be the results, you know, winning. And then once you won your first race and that, that fear, it sounds really bad, but being better than everyone else, that's what then drove me to, you know, to continue and to push harder and to try harder and to do all those different things to, to continue. It's, it's like a rush. It's, um, um, so yeah, to continue like a drug addict, you have that hit and then bang, you want it again and again and again. So it's um, not that I'm a drug addict, but, um, but yeah, so that's the sort of feeling you're always chasing. So talk to us about the journey to Europe and how that whole opportunity came about. 
Yeah, so it wasn't an easy journey. Um, I suppose I stopped racing for quite a period of time, just mum and dad. Um, dad's a floor, uh, laid carpet for a living. They had a carpet shop and business out at West Sydney, Penrith. I was always told I was wasting my time go-karting. I'd never amount to anything and all that sort of stuff, which then fueled me to be sort of want it even more. But um, so we, dad had a drama at business, so we stopped racing for quite a while. Then a guy called Jim Morton helped out and sort of paid a bit of money and, and sort of got the ball rolling, got me to Europe. Um, and then obviously I won the world championships and those, those sorts of things. Um, but it, um, it wasn't easy, like it was, like a lot of people probably think. I left home when I was 14, 15 years old. Lived in Europe by myself in Italy in an apartment above a restaurant and the lady in the restaurant would cook and clean my clothes. Not cook my clothes, but cook for me <laughs> and clean my clothes. Um, and through the week it was fine when, you know, all the teams there and you're sort of mingling. But on the weekends, like on Friday, they would all go home and, and do it. And I'd sit in a hotel or an apartment by myself over the weekend, sort of 15, not, no one to talk to and just sit there and wait for the next Monday. And then you'd sort of have someone to hang out with and talk to. So. Um, it's not as glamorous as what it sounds, um, but then obviously the success was there and I won the Karting World Championships and then I met, um, it was all ending because my dad said to me, hey look, we can't go car racing, I can't afford it, so what we're going to do, just pack in the, the go-karts because I was racing in Europe, come home, be part of the family business, lay carpet, do all that sort of stuff. And I was at, um, I went to Bathurst just before that. and. Um, Neil, I remember I was talking to Neil Crompton and he said, so what are you going to do next year? You've got to start getting into cars and doing that. And I said, oh, actually, the dream's over, mate. I'm starting working for Dad um, this coming week. And Neil was shocked and he's like, don't do it, you know, don't commit. And I'm like, it's my dad. Um, but then Neil said, let me talk to a few people and see if we can rustle something up. I had been racing in America for a couple of years, so I had lots of North American contacts. And I knew plenty of people in the European motorsport scene. So through the mutual friend, uh, James' dad, Jim, and another fellow by the name of Kim White approached me and said, my goodness, kid's got all this talent. What on earth are we gonna do? You can't be a world champion and just end up evaporating into nothing. What can you do? I didn't have the money to be able to help. So I went to Steve Horn, who was a very successful IndyCar team owner at the time, to Malcolm Osler, who was the technical director of Reynard Race Cars, who was, the, they were the biggest racing car manufacturer in the world at that point. And also to Alan Gow, who I'd worked with as the team manager at Peter Brock's in the late 80s. And Gow had helped some other young drivers, Neil Cunningham and Paul Radisich, who became the world touring car champion at one point in the 90s. And uh, they all kind of shrugged their shoulders because it's, this is an age old problem in motorsport. Gow saw something in James that he thought was worth investing in and so he did. So he put some money up and that was the first transitional moment that got James really started in professional motorsport. A couple of days later, Neil called and said, hey, a guy called Alan Gow wants to meet you in, in Sydney. Can you, um, can your dad take you in to meet him? So I asked dad, dad's like, yep, if we can have the day off work and go in. Um, so then I sat down in front of Alan Gow um, and Alan said to me, um, motorsport's been great to him. Um, he'd like to give something back. He said, I'm not going to pay a whole career. He said, I'll pay you for your first year um, in Formula Ford, in British Formula Ford. And if you're good enough, then someone else will pick it up, pick you up and sponsors or manufacturer and, and sort of carry you on. So, um, and if it doesn't work out, we had a crack. Um, but if it does work out, I own you um, and forever. But it's not forever, but um, so I, he said, don't answer the question now, go home with your dad and talk about it. So I already knew what it was, I was gonna go and do it. And then that weekend I ended up flying back to England and, and um, went and lived with Alan and started doing British Formula Ford. Um, the first year, I, can't, I think I was fourth in the championship maybe, got the works drive the next year so the team paid for the racing, won the British Formula Ford championship, then got a test with Jaguar to do um, Formula 3 and F1 stuff. Um, and yeah, and then did well at the test, and then I was there. I was, I was a young kid from Penrith, 19, driving a Formula One car. It was, um, it was pretty, um, pretty cool feeling to have, you know, from such a young age, from eight, seven, eight years old, to be so hyper focused on something, and then to be there. I remember the first test, be there, and be so nervous but so excited at the same time. But it's, um, it's been a crazy journey, um, but it was amazing to make it.
So when you go back to England and you're part of the British Formula Ford Championship, what in the back of your mind did you think you needed to do to prove that you would be able to progress to a test in a Formula One yeah, car? Ultimately, I just had to win. I had no um, choice with, um, you know, there's no financial backer, guys that had there with a heap of money that, or well, my dad that could pay and sort of keep it going. It was every year was, if you don't win, or get someone excited enough to sign you up for the next year, it's over. So that whole, even from, you know, from when I left karting, it was kind of every year was a panic. Not a, yeah, it was a panic, I'm not gonna lie. But you're just fretting that you're not gonna, um, that you, you needed those results. And even, like I remember when I won the British Formula 4 Championship, I couldn't do anything, you know, any more than what I had done. I won more races than anyone else, had more pole positions, all that sort of stuff. Like broke all the records, but still, I wasn't guaranteed an F3 seat or a drive in you know the next year, and I remember then we went to Valencia and we had to have a, a test for the um, for the for the F3 and F1 stuff, and there was like eight guys from around the world from all the championships and to fight it out to to get the the drives. The deal was back in the day in British Formula Three, if you were successful and you were either a champion or perhaps the runner-up, you're pretty much guaranteed an opportunity to launch straight into Formula One. And that's precisely where James arrived. I think it was maybe 2002. And he had a great opportunity. The management at Jaguar were very keen on him and they were going through their own turbulent period. Of course, the irony of all this is they ultimately became Red Bull, having been uh, Jackie Stewart racing and uh, a huge investment made by Ford. Uh, in Formula 3, we were on pole 15 times or something in the first 16 races. He just had, he had two or three tents over everybody every time. He never wanted me to change the car. He wanted to leave the car alone. He was used to say, I know what the car does, let me drive it. I'll, I'll give you that little tenth or two you need. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty special time. So tell us about the opportunity with Jaguar and how that came about. Yeah, so part of the F3 thing and when I won, I got the F3 deal was to do F1 testing. Um, so it's um, just purely from winning the, F, the Formula 4 championship and then being a good, or oh, after crashing, having a great day the next day and getting the F1, oh, the F3 test. Uh, drive was then you got the opportunity to be, do the F1 stuff. So it was, um, it was just, yeah, and then they're watching how you're going in Formula 3 and if you're progressing and doing well, then I remember the first test was maybe mid-year in the F1 car. So from six months you go from driving a Formula Ford to a Formula 1 car, it's, um, yeah, it's quite a different power. So when did that opportunity present itself? So my first test, I, I can't remember exactly. I think it was about July 7th. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it was in July or June, July, somewhere like that. And um, it was at Monza, my first test. Um, I remember going there the day before and Andre, my other teammate, tested the day before, watching everyone test. It was amazing. You know, it was all dream was coming, my dream was coming true. Um, the next morning I was sitting in the motorhome and I was like completely myself like absolute like I could hardly stand I was so nervous and at the time Eddie Irvine was the the lead driver so Eddie's pretty dry so the guy and he's sort of laughing at me and he said what you got to do is just scare the shit out of yourself straight away and then it'll be fine so I'm like oh okay and he's like so when you go down pit lane 100% throttle and just hit the the start uh, the pit lane limiter and it'll just take off and it'll scare the shit out of you so I'm like okay so first of all to get out of the the, um, the pits it's a hand clutch that's all new I'm going down the pit lane, I'm like, okay, I'll better, I'll do what he says, he's experienced. Flat, hit the thing, holy shit, took off so fast, like it was ridiculous. And I remember um, accelerating like crazy and then the corner's coming at me so fast and I broke, wobbled around the first corner, it was an installation lap, so wobbled around the lap and then came back in and then you have to get out for 20 minutes while they check all the dual systems check. And after 20 minutes, they're like, okay, you can jump back in now and we'll start the test. And it was that wild that I was like, do I really want to get back in? Like that's how insane the power was. And um, I remember coming down around the foot for my first time, like down the straight, you're doing 350 kilometers an hour. It's like, it's a blur. You're looking so far into the distance. So you don't really see anything peripherally. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember pulling the gears going past, geez, the pits went past pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And you see the 300 or the 400 meter board, 350, 300, 250, and I was like, this thing isn't gonna stop, I'm, just, I'm gonna break here. <laughs> and I remember breaking and then thinking, oh geez, and then had to change three gears to get to the corner. Like the performance was ridiculous, but it, 
you know, after a day's running or half a day, it all slows down and you, you sort of become accustomed to it. But it was, uh, it was a pretty amazing experience for, uh, for me after, you know, a little bloke from Penrith and then I was in Italy driving a million dollar Formula One car. It was, it was a pretty cool moment. Do you remember what you felt like at the end of that day? Oh, mate, I was that excited. Like, it was, I remember calling my dad and just being speechless because he, they sort of come along the journey for the, for the way and obviously, and calling and trying to get your feelings across. It was pretty, it was, it was amazing. It was, yeah, it was awesome. And what did your dad say? I just remember, like, I think we were both crying on the phone together, which is incredibly masculine, but, um, but it was, um, yeah, I remember him just saying how much, how proud, oh, I can't even talk, <laughs> how proud he was. It's a big deal to have been that little boy, eight years old, sitting there saying, I'm going to be that guy one day and having the opportunity to be right there on the brink of it. I mean, when you reflect on that and the journey to get to that point, I mean, there was a lot of sacrifice that went with that, wasn't there? You were a 14 year old sitting by yourself in an apartment in Italy. Had you not done that, you would never have been, you would never have gotten there. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, I suppose all of that goes away pretty quick when you, you get it, but there is so much sacrifice. And not only me doing my side, but my mum and dad for my sisters. Yeah. So I just gotta pull myself together to be able to talk. But no, my sisters um, obviously went without a lot of stuff. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that's hard to take and to, um, I suppose when you're living it, you sort of don't really, you're so focused on what you're doing. I suppose it's since I've gotten older and you sort of- And you're a dad. Yeah, and you're a dad and you come back and I've got relationships with obviously my family, but with my sisters, it's, it's um, yeah, I feel bad that I've sort of taken stuff off them along the way. But, yeah. but they're so proud <laughs> of you. I mean, they've been your biggest cheerleaders through your career. Mm. 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 You're working hard to make me cry, aren't you, Jess? <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, these are the but, things that but no, they're real. Um, and I think that's obviously what makes it so much more special, I guess. And because and, it's like racing. When we win, you feel guilty that you're the one guy standing on the podium. Like there's 20 guys that have worked their asses off to, to get that result. And unfortunately, you're the only guy up there. And it's same with, I suppose, with my career. Like it's, there's so many people along the way that um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So let's go to the crash at Monza. What do you remember about that day? I, my memory, I probably like legitimately, I don't remember much. Like I remember, the last thing I remember was seeing the wheel go past me and I was thinking that's not good. Um, and then seeing that go past and then I hit the curb on the exit of Ascari because I got no brake. So I pushed my foot down and there's no, nothing because one of the front wheels off the ground, the other one, the rear um, whole rear corner, right rear corner has come off. So then it's pulled the floor off the wing, the side pod. So I've got no drag. So the car isn't, because with an F1 car, if you back off, it breaks harder than, you know, our supercar, because just through the drag and all that sort of stuff. But, so none of that's working, no brakes. The wheels come off and I hit the curb and I remember being in the air and thinking, should I let go? Because they say to let go of the steering because it's going to break your wrist. And then I remember waking up with um, someone yelling at me and I was still holding on with my left hand and I went to talk on the radio because the radio was on the right and I couldn't move my arm and then I started to panic and I opened my visor and it was all like red and I remember wiping my face and it was sort of, I couldn't really see too well and they were yelling at me to stay in the car and I was like, because I could see the carnage. I'm like, last thing I want to do is still be in here. So anyway, so I wrestled out and they helped me out of the car and, and um, yeah, and that's, that's about it. But I don't remember the impact. How fast were you going? Um, it was about like into there, I think it was 325 kilometers an hour or something. So, and then I went backwards at like 68 or something. So it was quite a bit. And all the red or what I couldn't see was blood coming out of my eyes. Like my eyes were bleeding, like tears were blood, ears, blood coming out, nose, mouth, other orifice, orifices lower with blood coming out. So it was pretty serious. It was just from the, um, the G-forces on the impact. And then I, um, they said, because of the trauma, there's a um, vein or an artery or something that goes over your ear here that was ruptured or it had damaged. 
they had some damage on it. And because of the swelling, I was paralysed on that side for a while. So that's what, that's why I couldn't move the arm and that's why my vision was funny. And who was the person leaning over you trying to get you out? Uh, it was Mr Schumacher, apparently, so. Michael Schumacher? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got a phone call. In those days, there was no internet, so it was a phone call or a fax. So you'd often get up in the morning and there'd be a big pile of paper curled up on the floor. Uh, but the phone call came to say that he had an accident and it was a bad one. So your first response is, is he OK? And he, and he wasn't fantastic. Uh, so the impact on him was enormous and it took him out of contention to win the British Formula 3 Championship. And I don't know that I've ever really got to the bottom of how much it rattled him physically and mentally, but it did. Yeah, so he went to Monza, he was testing. I was obviously across his program there. We were chatting. I heard he'd had the accident. He got hold of me that night. They flew him home on the, I think it was a Friday night. I went and got him Saturday morning. And while all that was happen, happening, I'd got hold of Dr. Sid Watkins and uh, Gary Hartston, and we went and took him. I went and took him for a, a brain scan the next morning and yeah the result of that was that there was severe con concussion and a lot of brain swelling on one side of his brain and they uh, basically said you can't drive a car for five weeks minimum if you have another impact it could kill you. Did you actually have a real understanding of just how badly you'd been injured? Um, no I probably yeah I, I, I kind of did because I couldn't move my arms as much as what and I, the thing is when I was in Italy as well, because I lived in Italy, so I could speak Italian, but I couldn't speak proper Italian. I was slang like guys chat. So I was in the hospital and I'm trying to talk to the doctor about and understand how much movement, like if, was it going to come back? Yeah. Was it completely going to come back? Was I only going to have a little bit? What was going on? And I think that was the hardest part to deal with. And because you're alone, um, it, it's, um, yeah, it was pretty... Pretty, that was the scariest part. But once I got out and back to England, it was much better. Speaking to your mum and dad after that had happened, what that conversation was like? I remember calling them at the airport and just saying, I'm okay. But I had like the crazy, as you can imagine, the craziest headache. So I didn't want to talk and I couldn't open my eyes because it just hurt like crazy. So I just said to them, hey, I'm all right. I'm going back to England. Um, and I think Adrian was in contact and Alan with mum and dad and sort of keeping them up that, you know, he's alive, it's not, it's all going to be okay. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I just remember saying that I was going to be all right, but that's about it. What was the emotion like for you at the time when you realised that that F1 seat was not going to be yours? I was crushed, like destroyed. It, um, yeah, I was gutted. I'd, my whole life was that was it. That's what was going to happen. I was, you know, I'd got, and I think probably if it happened, if I never even got the Jaguar test and everything, it probably would have been an easier sort of, oh, well, we sort of got pretty close. But to, like, you're pretty much there. You're in and around the time, you know all the team, you're there and you're just waiting for someone to either not be fast enough or to be sick or something and then you're, you're up and you're in and you're ready. So I think it made it that much harder that I was, I was there, ready to go. And um, through no, um, nothing of my own doing, it, um, yeah, it all sort of disappeared. It would have taken something incredible for him not to end up in the F1 car. Um, he was really their golden child. He was performing as you'd expect. We were leading the championship by a mile at the time. So as much as you're a shoe in he would have been a shoe in for that drive. And um, we all know what that went, that team went on to become. Um, so yeah, who knows what could have happened. When you've worked your way into a position, which is the hardest thing to do in motorsport, to be able to get all of the ingredients together, to have the right finance, to have the right people around you, to be in the right team, to be in the right car, to put together the victories, to conquer the kids from Italy, from Brazil, from Japan and whatever. He got himself into that position, rightly or wrongly. And closing out that deal with a British Formula 3 championship was almost an automatic guarantee to be able to launch into something big internationally, if not Formula 1. So when that tipped over as a result of the accident, there was clearly a physical impact on James, and I'm not sure that I've ever truly got to the bottom of it, but I know that there was an emotional impact 
And I think at that point really then it was, which has happened to many, many drivers, they, they then question, okay, what, what is it all about and where am I going to land? Because Formula One's up here and then there's everything else. So I think that that was a moment that took James quite a long time to recover from. Were you angry? Yeah, I was angry for a long time. I was um, well, disappointed, I guess. Um, I suppose you sort of then quickly shift your, your, your I suppose, your way of thinking and, and, and you know, I was so fo F1 focused. And I remember, you know, talking with Neil and Alan and a lot of people at the time, and they were like, hey, look, you, there's still other things you can race and you can still have a career. Like, it, it, the world isn't over. So it was just, um, you know, those first six months were pretty crap. But then once I started racing other things and I moved to Japan and started doing Super GT and, and F3 and Formula Nippon and driving these all these other cars, I was then, I suppose my love for racing came back really quite quickly when I started doing Super GT because the cars were racing really quite close. You could hit, you could, so it reminded me a lot of karting. And I got that passion and that love of just competing and that aggression and, like lunging guys, as I'm probably a little too aggressive at times, but um, I, all that came flooding back. And I suppose I was so focused on the F1 side of things, I lost the love of the driving and it was more the dream I was chasing, not the love of the sport or the game. And I suppose it sort of, my thinking then changed and it sort of came back, the love of it all and how lucky I am to be able to be doing this. And, and ultimately that's, why I ended up coming back to supercars because I had so much fun driving the GT cars and I was like watching supercars racing at home and I was like geez those guys are doing this but on the next level and they get to live at home um, they get paid great money and they can be home on Sunday night I'm, I'm going back home and I remember talking to Neil and saying mate I'm done I want to come back and Neil's like don't come back yet you know make sure you get yourself sorted because once you come back, you're never going back again. And I'm like, mate, I'm done, I'm out. I've had enough of being away from home. I think at that point it was like 14 years or something. So I cautioned him about the notion of, don't think for a nanosecond that this is a step back competitively. It could well be the other direction. It's actually even more intense than some of the motorsport you might encounter overseas. But he wanted to be home and he wanted to have some of the bits of the, his life that had been missing in those, well, the really, really young years, single digits and double digits in the early teens. So, yeah, and then, it, um, then I came back and since coming back here, like, it's, it's funny, like, I, now, having experienced all that sort of stuff, I wouldn't change anything. Like, I, I don't think I would be as a happy, fulfilled sort of person and character and racing and the person, I definitely wouldn't be the person I am, I would be an if I was in Formula One, but. Why do you say that? I don't know, it was just funny. But I think, I think, I don't know if disappointment or whatever it changes you. And I think I was, like I was pretty arrogant. Like I remember, um, like we'd be at, I'd be here at the Grand Prix, like next weekend, I'll be in the F1 pit lane like, with the Jaguar guys and journalists would be like, oh, have you ever thought about doing supercars? I'd be like, those old <laughs> driving those heaps. I'm not doing that. Like you'd sort of really put your nose, oh, you know, look up above all that sort of stuff. And I suppose I would have probably kept along that sort of mentality, but, you know, through disappointment and change and, you know, being hurt and all this sort of stuff, you change your perspective on things. And, um, you know, I, I love what I do. Like, there's, there is nothing that comes close to being on the start line the thing on the limit, there's 24 other idiots ready to run into you or however many there is, 23. And, you know, watching the light and just like the anticipation of releasing the, the, the line locker and dropping the clutch. And then it's all hell breaks loose. And that's, that is the most amazing feeling in the world. Nothing can ever come close to it. So that's why I wake up every morning and keep smiling doing these interviews, do stupid things with the wiggles, all that sort of stuff, so I can keep doing this, because it's like, I love what I do. Like, it is so bloody cool. And it's um, awesome to be out of, from eight years old to be do something you love every day of your life until I'm, you know, I'm 43, still doing it. Yeah. And not gonna hang up the helmet anytime soon. Definitely not. So it's, um, I got another couple of years to go before I have to argue and convince someone that I'm still good enough to do it. 
But, um, but yeah, I'm having a ball. You make a really interesting point around having to bend to the pressure that you knew you had to perform, that you had to get results and have success if you were going to be able to continue to doing it. How has that whole concept served you in your career? Do you think that's actually been the magic bean in, in driving you to, to find the best out of yourself and reach your potential? Yeah, pressure makes diamonds, Jess. So uh, I, um, I, a lot of, you can look at two things, uh, things all different ways, but I suppose with me when, you know, the pressure comes up and, or you, you know, you're with a big team and you, you know, at the race and you're about to win or you're trying to win a race or whatever, it's, for me, it, yeah, I'm here because of my results. I'm here because of the, you know, the guy I am and the results and how driven I am and the focus and, and all that sort of stuff. So I'd probably, more confident or competent on who I am and my ability. So I don't, I don't, I think that comes from, you know, having to fight so hard for it all at such a young age and being told, like, mate, you're a Western Sydney white trash, you're never gonna make it, you're dreaming, all that sort of stuff. Um, all the way through school, told you never made to anything. And so that's driven me initially. And then I think having to not have, not having someone pay the whole way and, you know, all that sort of stuff, having to, defend for yourself, live by yourself, all that. I never questioned my own ability or who I was. And I think a lot of that comes from the people that you're surrounded with at a young age and you grew up with and, and people putting those sorts of values in your life. Um, so I think just being so sure about who I am, but um, has probably been the thing that I've sort of learnt to embrace and not be shy about being competent and, and you know, having the confidence that you you know you're going to be able to de to deliver. So I don't ever shy away from anything. Like load the pressure on. The only reason I, there's pressure on me is because you guys think I can do it. So let's just go and get it done. Um, I'm not sort of someone that panics and thinks, oh geez, everyone's looking. It's going to be yeah. So it's um yeah. I suppose a lot of it comes from your upbringing and and you know things that happen along the way. It's gratifying to know that in some small way you helped contribute to somebody's dreams for him to be able to be a professional racing driver. The fact that he didn't make it into Formula One, I, I don't see that as a black mark against either him or me or anybody around him. I think there's whatever, there is eight billion people on the planet trying to be one of the 20 Formula One drivers is a pretty tough equation. So the very fact that he was able to sit in one, to drive one, to be considered to drive one, I think that's a feather and that, that's a good thing. He should have been in Formula One. He should have been, you know, you're not going to say Alonso or any of those guys, but he should have been now at that point where he's thinking, I'm getting too old for Formula One like Fernando is, still delivering the goods. He would have had a 10, 15 year career, you know, at the front of Formula One. That's, that's the level of talent he had. And that's the drive and determination and natural skill. The guy has so much natural skill. You can argue that he probably doesn't, you know, he's too much of the joker outside of the car, but inside the car, the, the car he's just got this talent to fill the tyre. You know, he was so good at, at getting the most out of the tyre and that, that natural ability. He would, have, he would have had a good career in Formula 1. As you sit in the twilight of your career and look back on all the lessons you've learned and the person you've become as a consequence of those, if you were going to tell eight-year-old James, who was sitting in front of the TV, dreaming of becoming a Formula 1 driver, about the journey or give him advice, and it might not be you, it might be another kid out there that had yeah. has the same dream that you had, what would you say to them? Um, I suppose that one quote I sort of lived by, I suppose, my whole life has been, you only get a sore neck looking backwards. Like, deal with what's in front of you and what you can change. You know, don't dwell on what, you know, the bad decision you've made or, or whatever, it, it's done. Let's move forward and focus on what's in front of us rather than, what's behind us, so it'd be, it'd probably be that. Never ever give up. Never give up. I'm still, look at me, I'm 43, still. Guys that I could be my son I'm racing against. My teammate could legitimately be my son, which is, <laughs> which is cool when you towel them up. So it's, um, but yeah, it's, yeah. I don't, I don't think I'll ever lose that drive and that passion and that determination because that start line is so bloody cool. Well, we are so pleased that you found your way to us 
at supercars eventually, and you've been such a stalwart of the championship for such a long time. Thanks for sharing your story today on Fox Sports. No, thank you, Jess.